Hi everyone, this is Counseling 4480, Osborne Chapter 3, Some Measurement Concepts. So this one's a little bit longer, but really not that long, and it kind of reviews again some of the concepts that we had reviewed in the earlier part of the semester, but more of an applicable way. Okay, norms. Is this tool appropriate for this client? Test appropriateness should be partially based on whom the test was piloted. Piloted basically means initially tested. So usually whenever we have a, uh, a survey or a test, let's say the SAT, right? The people who created it need to test it out first to make sure that these questions are appropriate and it actually is measuring what it says it's supposed to measure and it's consistently measuring those things as well. And so uh, we wanna make sure that the people who are tested are going to also be the same or similar situations as the people who were tested originally so that we can actually make a real comparison. If we don't, then things are going to be a little off and we're going to say, well, the age is going to be different. So obviously these things are going to be different or their ethnicity is different. So obviously the scores are going to be different. So you usually want to make sure. And in modern times now, a lot of tests are normed appropriately, like to um, the amount of people, diversity in America and stuff like that. What groups the test has been shown to have value? So also the results, you know, which ones were more accurate? in predicting something or whatever it is that it's supposed to be doing. If a test was normed on college students, using an elementary school would be unethical. And the reason why is because, let's say that this test is gonna determine something, make a big decision, that'll be inappropriate for you to give a college level test to an elementary one uh, person and then say, oh, you didn't score very well, so you're not allowed to go to this college. If it's an elementary school student, they haven't really learned a lot yet compared to, let's say, a college student, right? So the results would be not fair for that person or unethical. A normative sample, level of performance obtained by the individuals used in the developing the score standards, like we talked about in the pilot test, right? And usually there's a lot more than just one test. Uh, they talk about pilot as in the sense of like, you know, the overall beginning of this and the creation of this testing. It's also known as a typical or a normal score is another way to say normative sample. Some are based on general populations, such as, you know, this is uh, the census. You know, you have to fill out those things that say, you know, what kind of ethnicity, how old you are and all that other stuff. And so that helps people who are creating things to go, hey, if 20% of America, let's say, is Latinx and 10% is African-American and 10% is Asian, and then the rest of it is Caucasian, when you do the test, you might want to have something similar to the people taking the test. We'll have 20% Latinx, 10% African American, 10% Asian or whatever, and then the rest of them Caucasian. So it's similar. So it makes sense because it's sampling what the census is saying is true that exists in America. Others use based on specific groups. So for other ones, it might just specifically be 12th graders or people who are left-handed people who are formerly drug users or or people who you know use substances or people with physical disabilities who so want to compare those those specific groups instead right because if you test um, a norm let's say a group of people who do not do drugs and then you test someone who does do drugs their scores can be very different but if we actually test people who also do drugs as well you know then we kind of maybe get a similar understanding in brain development or stunt or whatever it is i don't really know you know depending on whatever it's being measured do you understand like you know you can't really uh ask a group of people that are totally different than the person that you're going to test to and then compare them and say that they're equals they're not equals because they have different uh lives okay um a norm table uh, vary from test to test and a norm table basically is kind of like the the results and then how we can use them to compare so they're going to be very different the self-directed search has a table that talks about being male female middle school high school college or an adult so you can compare all those different groups so let's say that your client is a female college student then we can actually go in there and then compare those things okay the ASVAB has one about gender so they're talking about male female and or combination of both like you can see the results for both men and women when they were being tested. Um, but then they also have other demographic characteristics as well. So depending on what you're trying to compare, you can say, you know, well, the women that we tested compared to your client who is a woman, these are the results, right? So we can actually pick specific characteristics in this norm table so that we can compare those things specifically.
As a counselor, you must determine whether the norm population resembles your client's background and characteristics. So when you pick out an assessment, you want to make sure that it kind of matches with your client or is acceptable towards your client. If your client is, let's say, a Buddhist who is male, who is you know, English as a second language learner, was that something that was considered in the normative test? You know, did they uh, consider that or was it all just, you know, American born, English as a first language, because then that might also alter things as well. It doesn't mean that that person can't take the test, but the results are not necessarily as accurate as they would be if it was, uh, you know, norm to the, the same type of person. National norm is a general population norms usually controlled in the sampling process to be balanced in geographical area, ethnicity, educational level, sex, age, and other factors. Sometimes the national norm is not helpful because you really want to compare the client scores with a specific group. So they cannot predict success in a certain job at a local factory. So what that is saying is you might not, you might, you know, get the results and compare yourself to all of America, but maybe if you were born in a specific small town, you probably want to compare yourself to the rest of that small town, not all of America, because if you've ever visited America in different, you know, if you've ever left, let's say Los Angeles, you would know that Washington state is very different than New York state, which is very different than Chicago or Illinois, let's say we're talking about states or Texas or Florida. So sometimes if you have like a national norm, we might get to see the overall, but it might not necessarily be very applicable to you if you are staying in, let's say, Los Angeles, or if you're going to stay in, you know, uh, you know, a small little town in in Kansas. Okay, local norms, which is what we're talking about, operational and educational requirements vary from one location to another. Local norms should be developed whenever possible, but requires time and resources. Why? Because you now need to, as the administrator, go into the manual and read about where the, the test was normed, you know, and stuff like that. So you can see whether or not you can figure out how to norm it uh, and have create this norm table for, let's say, your state or your city or whatever it is. Score profiles. One source of information on individual characteristics is your score profiles. It provides a visual representation of the peaks and valleys in a person's test results. It helps identify what falls within the normal range or a higher range or a lower range. The differences between scores should be interpreted with caution. Profiles should be interpreted with concern for the influences of norms and scores should be expressed in ranges rather than in points. So what that is saying is your score, right? Your raw score uh, will show a person going up and down and stuff like that. But once we interpret it, the score uh, into, a, let's say, a range or something that actually might show us a little bit more of the realistic uh, achievements or abilities that you have. OK, it shows. Let's say that uh, we're talking about an overall educational test. So it might have math, biology, English um, and history. Right. So when you take a test like that, some subjects you might score really well and some scores you might not or some subjects you might score very low or maybe in the middle or all high. So that's what it's saying when it says that we can see the peaks and the valleys, right? The peaks are the high parts, the valleys are the lower scores. And so then we can understand who you are when it comes to that specific test. Um, and um, what we want to also know is, you know, are you really good at specific subject? If you are, that's really great. We don't necessarily need to focus on that. If we're, let's say, talking about returning back to school, uh, maybe we need to just focus on the areas that you you had your 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 your, uh, your valleys so that you can improve those areas. OK, um, and of course, again, interpret with caution, because, again, we talked about the person, um, you know, if they're a minority, a person of color, the scores might be a little bit different because of that. So for those reasons, as well as other reasons, like you might have had a bad day or whatever, you were distracted or whatever, um, you want to maybe see it in a range as opposed to a specific one point. OK, so let's say that out of 100 and you score uh, 84, right? Maybe if you were having a better day, it would have been a 94. But maybe if it was a really bad day, you would have had a 74, right? So you want to have a range that we know that is more realistic to you. OK, and so we'll explore that a little bit more when we talk about uh, measurements of error and then also your true score. But a range is also really helpful because it doesn't pinpoint you to exactly. Let's say if you had, um, let's say, an 89, which is like, let's say some people will see an 89 as a B, 
right? A B plus. But for some people, they're like, you know what though? I have seen this person participate in class and they talked a lot and they showed me that they were actually really smart. Maybe it, they were just having a bad day on that test and that's why I have an 89. I'll push them over to a 90 or a 93 or whatever because I believe that this person actually might be actually smarter than or better than the score that they got. Okay, or it might be the other way around. It might be just because they're lucky that they guessed and they got that. And so actually their score is actually a little bit lower. Maybe it's really 84 or something like that instead. And we'll talk about that more as we go through this uh, chapter. So the differences between scores, small score differences are meaningless and should be attributed to change effects. So that's what they're saying right there, right? So for example, let's say we're talking about the RIASAC. The certain scores are for the R is 52. I is 30, A is 28, S is 12, E is 14, and C is 27, right? So you want to focus on the RIA uh, or even the RIC because 27 and 28 are really close to each other. Um, so for that, they might go, you know, let's explore those two different sets. With the R being the highest, it might lead your interpretation. So instead of looking at something that is a base, which is 28, or a C-based career, you definitely want to look at the R base because that's 52. That's the highest. And so you kind of do the code, the Holland code, in the order of highest scores or your peaks uh, and ignore your values, let's say, for this specific one. So here's another example is um, the R is 32, the I is 30, the A is 28, the S is 21, the E is 22, and then the C is 27. So here, the numbers are all kind of in the same range-ish, right? So you do not want to focus on the high score since they're all kind of the same. Instead, use the results to talk to the client about what they're interested in and take it from there. And the reason why is because their scores are basically saying that they're all in the same area. So if they're all the same, we want to know then you as a person, what do you think about this? What are your results? What are your preferences? Because for some people, they're very indecisive and so their scores are going to be all the same. Or if they're not very, uh, op let's say they're very open, they might also have a score that is kind of flat like this. In that sense, they're like, oh, well, actually, I can be happy doing anything. Okay, so it could be two ways. It could be I don't really know much and that's why all my scores are the same or I really am just very open. So you can see it in different ways and interpret it in different ways and hopefully you as a trained person will then be able to at least have a dialogue with that person and find out which one of those two it is. Scores as a range, we talked a little bit about that before. Um, some people's profiles report a range that includes the error of measure of, at, of each test. Percentile graph by a bar, line, or row of X's with the obtained percentile at the center. This is to show where a person's true score might actually be. So the visual for this one is basically, let's say that um, the test is from 0 to 100 and the person's score is 74 but they actually have a little line, this little bar line that says really it's from 70 to 85 or something like that, right? So then that calculation, it's a mathematical calculation, lets you know that this person's score, although they have it at exactly at 74 on the test, their real score might actually range from either 70 to 85, okay? And we don't really know because that person might be having a bad day or they were distracted or whatever it is. And so we want to say that the real score could be either from here to there. We don't really know. And so we want to let you know that this is what happens, okay? And to consider that, you know, if they're hitting into the 80s, that means, hey, that means that they're passing with a B or whatever, let's say, okay? Um, example he is here, uh, for this is you were having a bad day when you took the test, so your score might not be the true score. Showing a range such as, a, uh, they're also known as confidence bands, is what the range is called, shows that uh, where the person's true score more accurately than the exact point. Because again, we really don't know. We, we kind of know, you know, that you are around this area and that's good enough and that actually is very helpful for a person to, to understand that. Okay, here's a transformation of scores. So usually when people have raw scores, it doesn't really mean stuff. You actually change it into a standardized score where um, you can apply to, let's say, a curve or something like that. So again, raw scores are usually not very useful. You transform the raw score into either a normal bell curve, a percentile, a standard T score, stay nine, or grade equivalents. There's actually more than that, but these are the most popular ones. 
And the reason why is then when you look at a graph of some sort, you can compare it very easily once you understand how to convert your raw score to a specific type of score, like a, a standard T-score or whatever it is. Um, so here's an example on this slide of a normal bell curve. And um, I'm not here to teach you statistics, but I want you to see what it is. I think that you guys have all already taken a statistics class. Um, I'm not asking you to do a standard deviation or anything like that. I just want you to look at it and be familiar with it, not be afraid of it, because really it's just a chart. And once you have the score and you understand what the score means, then you can sort of plot that into the, the curve and you can say, oh, well, this is the result and we understand what this means when it comes to comparing them, uh, your client, to a whole group of people that were used to pilot this or standardize this. A bell-shaped curve. So, what is a bell curve, or a normal curve, or whatever you would uh, you were taught it was called? I have these two YouTube links that are really, really helpful because it shows to you all the different types of bell curves. It's only a couple minutes each. I chose ones that were really short. I want you guys to please pause this lecture and then actually go through these two links and visit them and really just, you know, just listen to it. I'm not asking you guys to actually draw one out or anything like that. Just listen and then kind of see the examples that they give so that you understand how a bell curve works. And then also um, there is a YouTube video for a stay nine. And again, a stay nine it's just another type of conversion of your raw score. And um, it's really helpful because then when you hear when someone says that they have a stay nine of six, you're like, oh, I know exactly where that is because on the graph that I provide you on the slide, you know exactly where they are positioned, right? Or a percentile or whatever it is. Please watch these videos. They're not very long. And then return back to this uh, lecture. Okay, criterion reference test. Evaluate a person's knowledge or skills as it relates to an established knowledge base. So criterion basically is you know, the word criteria, which is, you know, what are your, the criteria uh, for you to be able to get accepted to this school? What are the requirements, right? So that's what the criterion reference test means. We say that as a third grader, you need to know how to add and subtract, right? So those are part of the criterion that we're gonna ask you to then take if you were a third grader. Um, specific information is provided as to what the person is capable of doing. The subject was able to subtract numbers with decimals, let's say. If that is a criterion, subtract with decimals, then you want to test them about subtracting with decimals, right? And then we can compare. Um, criterion reference test compares students' knowledge and skills against a predetermined standard, cut score, or other criterion. Again, what are the requirements? In criterion reference tests, the performance of other students does not affect a student's score. So what other people's results are doesn't really matter. We're talking about what they need to know, okay? So just because their partner can't do it doesn't affect them. Let's say, let's say student A score does not affect student B's score because it doesn't matter about those two. We're just still comparing it to whether or not they can uh, subtract, let's say, decimals and stuff like that. Accuracy of measurement. So when we talk about accuracy, we're talking about reliability, validity, the standard error of measure, SEM, and then the expectancy tables. So we've already lectured a little bit about reliability and validity, but we'll review it here. Um, in the previous uh, slides in um, the Zunker book. So, but I just wanted to kind of like refresh you when it comes to the application of it, okay? Um, so again, you can see like accuracy versus precision. If you look at the slide image that I have on this slide, um, precise but not accurate is, let's say that you were shooting a target, but you got all of it all in one area, but it's not the center. So that means that it's consistent, right? It's reliable, the person who's shooting it is reliable, but they're just not shooting the right area, but they always shoot in the same place. When it's all in the middle, that means that it is valid and reliable because what that's saying is you were able to get in the middle all the time. So it's always consistently where you need to go, okay? So we're gonna talk about reliability and validity with reliability first. So what that means is how consistent a test measures the construct of consistency and then the degree to which test scores are free from error. So no test is completely free from error. Instead, consider that a client's observed score is a true score with the errors added in. So for example, let's say that we were giving a test to someone and we gave the test to them five times, right? The first time they scored 75, the second time they scored 73, the third time they scored 76, 
and the next one after that will be let's say 80 so that's five times right so we kind of know that they have a range between 73 and 80 and most likely their true score is going to be somewhere in there but depending on the day that they were having maybe they were really tired or maybe they drank too much coffee and now they're over caffeinated the scores might change a little bit but we understand that that range that they have between 73 and 80 is pretty consistent, right? However, let's say that we give this test five times to another person. One time they score four, one time they score 100, one time they score 94, one time they score 45, and then maybe 50. Those numbers are just all over the place, which means that it's not consistent at all. It's not anywhere. So then we're like, what is this measuring? We don't know. Is it measuring anything at all? And that's what it means when it comes to consistency is, are you able to, if they give this test a bunch of times, will that person range in the same area all the time? Or will it be inconsistent and range all over the place? Because if it is, then we really don't know what we're talking about when we look at the data. Okay. Um, reliability coefficients provide an estimate on how stable the test is. So whenever you read a journal article and they do an experiment, they'll also give you a reliability score. And the score is rated from 0.00 to 1. Okay, um, that's the range. So when you see reliability and it falls between 0.85 and 0.95, that means it's pretty reliable or pretty consistent. But if it's at a 0.3, then you're gonna like, oh, this reliability is not so great. I don't know if I wanna actually use this results or anything like that, because it's showing that it's not consistent, right? Um, so that's something that you wanna look at. And you'll never really get a 1.00 range because that's just too perfect. And most times that just can't happen. But we at least now know whenever you read a journal article and it says the validity is between 0.85 and 0.95, you're like, okay, that means that this, this test is pretty consistent and, and dependable. Um, factors that influence reliability include the length of the test. So longer tests have higher reliability. So I'll give you an example. If I give you a test on multiplication and I give you 50 questions, okay? And when you do it, most likely you'll get some wrong, right? But it's not really gonna affect your grade if you get a couple wrong. However, if the test was only three questions long and you got two of them wrong, then that really says that you missed out on a lot, right? So it's not necessarily fair. So we wanna choose a certain amount of questions that might be right, uh, a longer one, but we don't want it to be too long. If it's like 500 questions, you're gonna get exhausted or tired, and then you might stop answering the questions or taking it seriously. So there's actually, uh, 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 when you're developing an assessment, there's actually a number of questions that people might find appropriate through, through testing and, and, and test development. Um, the type of scoring, so objective scoring has higher reliability than subjective scoring. So objective scoring would be, let's say, um, let's say that if you give you a test and it was a math test, and you had specific answers. If you had the answer is, let's say, 4.3, and then your response is 4.3, then we're like, okay, that's really good. You got it right. However, if it's a subjective score, which means kind of more of your opinion or your, your, your ideas and perceptions, it might be very different than another person. That's why then people are like, oh, is it really reliable? I'll give you an example. It would be, let's say, a picture-based test. Let's say an inkblot test right and I give you this ink blot test and um, this thing most people will say looks like let's say a bat right but you say it looks like a horse uh, then we're gonna say well maybe there's a reason why they think that this looks like a horse it's not consistent but you know uh, we need to consider it and stuff like that so again you can see how that's more opinion based or subjective or perspective ways as opposed to a math score where we know exactly the answer is 4.3 okay and then the variability of the group on which the test was given. So a heterogeneic uh, has a higher reliability than a homogeneic one, which basically means like if you get a bunch of different people testing it, it's more likely to have a, uh, the, the correct score than if you just get one group. Like for when we talk about uh, multiculturalism, if the entire test is measured by people who are Caucasian, a person who is Black or, or African American or Latinx or Asian, their scores might be a little bit different, right? And so then it's really unfair to deny someone of color, let's say, a, who has a lower score on a test that was really designed for people who are Caucasian, okay? And again, we're not saying that Caucasian people are bad or any tests like that, but we wanna make sure that it's diverse because in America, we are also a diverse population.
The difficulty of items on the test is the questions that are too easy or too hard dec uh, decreases reliability. Because if they're too easy, everyone's going to get them right. So then is anyone really testing anything real? Or if the questions are just way too hard and no one gets it, then of course then is it really measuring anything accurate or, or whatever either, right? So we want to get a, a sample of everything and that's uh, the responsibility of the test creator to do those things. And then of course validity is does the test measure what it purports to, uh, to measure or to answer? So a test that claims to measure interest shouldn't be measuring skills. Um, an example is let's say that you have a test that you say is going to be measuring depression, but none of the questions on there are about depression. They're all about anxiety. Okay, so that means that it's like a little confusing because I thought you were measuring depression, but you really weren't. So that's not really precise or accurate, right? And we want to make sure that validity is all about accuracy. Um, the validity falls on a 0.30 to a 0.5 range and rarely goes over a 0.6 range. So if you were reading a journal article about an assessment or let's say a manual of an assessment and the scores are from 0.3 to 0.5 range, um, then you're like, okay, this is good. This is the typical uh, acceptable one, okay? And then there's three types of ways to measure validity. There's content, criterion related, which means like the requirements, right? And then of course the construct, which is how it's created. So let's talk a little bit about content validity. Actual items on a test and is often determined by an expert panel. So one way for a person to see whether or not these questions are about depression and not about anxiety or about uh, something else is you ask people who are experts on depression to read them and say, you know, hey, what do you guys think about these questions? And they'll say, from my research, this is not a good question or this is a good question. And that's what the expert panel is. You actually invite people who are people that you respect, right? Who are, who are actually doing the job in the real world. And then they are gonna give you their experience, uh, their opinions because of their, uh, their experience. Sometimes it can be tricky for a math test if the math test is about measuring math skills, but there are word problems, is it really about math or is it about reading abilities? So if you have a math test and some of the questions are word problems, does that person then need to know how to speak English, read English, understand English ideas before they can actually do the math test? So then is it really just a math test or is it more about reading comprehension? Does that make sense? So that's something that a, 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 a expert panel will bring up and they'll say, I wouldn't have any word problems here because what happens if you have someone who is from a different country and they just moved here and they can't read English really well or they don't understand English very well, then their math scores are really not then applied, okay? Uh, criterion related to validity, the degree to which the test is related to an outcome. So like we said before, there's requirements. Did they reach those requirements? Can they prove that they have those requirements? And if they do, then that's good. But if they don't, then again, uh, we have an issue. For example, is an achievement test score are often used to predict whether a, uh, a student will be successful in college, okay? So the researcher will take the score and compare it to an indicator of success in college, such as GPA. So let's say that you take a test and you score really high. Now we wanna compare it to other things that show a success, which means your grades. Uh, or whatever it is. And then we'll see, do those both reflect the same thing? Because maybe if you took the test and you scored really low, but your GPA is a 4.0, then it doesn't match up. So then we're like, why would this test say that you failed when it says that you actually did really, really well, right? Obviously, this is just one type of example. It could be many other things that people compare it to, not just the GPA. Construct uh, validity answers the question, do the test results make psychological sense? So when you were creating it, did it actually make sense? So example would be the test says it's measuring career satisfaction. We would compare these test results with other tests that measure career satisfaction that are already established. If they have construct validity, those scores would be similar. So let's say that you created test B, okay? And uh, your results come out and now you're gonna compare that person who took that test with the people who did test A, and then maybe even compare it to test C. 
those are two that are already established in the world. People already use it all the time. It's trustworthy, it's dependable, and you know all that stuff. If it also has similar scores, that means that they're similar, which means that you have construct validity. When you created it, when you constructed it, it actually is similar to other ones that have been created as well. And that's what they're talking about. Standard error of measurement or SEM. An individual's performance on a test can be thought of as falling within a range or a band rather than a specific point. So like we've talked before, just because you took the test and you got an 89, it actually means that maybe you actually got a 93, right? But you were having a bad day or you were distracted, maybe your phone rang um, or someone got up and then you were looking at that student that was taking the test and then that distracted you. And so that's why your score was actually 89 when really maybe your score would have been a 93 or maybe you were having a really good day and your real score would have been like an 85 or something like that, right? So then there's that range that we were talking about. It's really important in assessments that we don't just depend on that one specific dot, like the 89 and that is it. Really, it could have ranged between a B or an A actually, right? By using the standard error of measurement, we are able to increase our confidence in interpreting scores, also known as confidence bands, like we talked about before. So example would be, while your score was 85 today, we are 95% confident that your true score lies between 75 and 90. Okay, and again, that's the range that was determined through a mathematical statistical formula uh, that then you would use. And that way, we don't kind of like pigeonhole you only at that specific thing. Like, let's say that if a student, let's say of mine, got a 79, and that is uh, a C, right? I would, a C plus, I would say, you know what, this person might actually be really a B minus student and not a C plus student. Okay, and that's because I use a confidence range or confidence band uh, when I give out, let's say, the tally of the scores for a specific student. Expectancy tables. In educational planning, a counselor often has to advise a student of changes of success in a particular college. An expectancy table constructed from the records of previous graduates and their performance at the university being considered provides relevant information. So here's an example of what we talked about before. Before, let's say we talk about the national, like everyone's uh, scores from the entire country, um, it might not necessarily work for one region of America because we are so diverse. So let's say that you have a student who is your client and they want to apply to three different schools. Those three different colleges might actually have three different sets of expectations. And so this is what we're talking about. It's creating an expectation table or expectancy table is that we want to cater to those three universities instead. Maybe one of them requires just a score. Let's say if the score is out of 1600, they're looking for a score between 1000 and 1100. And that'll be great for them. Another school might be a little bit more high end, might say we want someone who has a score of 1500 uh, to 1600 and that's it. We're going to only accept those people. Then another one might go, we don't really accept, we don't really care about those scores, scores so you don't even have to take that test, right? So when you know that, then you're going to create an expectancy, expectancy table for your student or your client so that they understand where they are in those three universities because we're not talking about every university because it would be different for everyone, right? So we're talking about specific ones. Correlations. Understanding how factors are related help a person make appropriate interpretations and interventions. So correlation is basically the relationships among constructs and scales. It can be positive, negative, strong or weak, or significant or insignificant. So when it comes to a positive correlation, that means when one factor is present, it's likely the other is also present. So an example would be the more candy a child eats, the more cavities that they have if they don't brush their teeth, right? A negative correlation is when one factor is present, it's likely that the other one is not going to be. So let's talk about schools, okay? Let's say that if it snows a lot, students are not going to show up to class. And that relationship is, you know, opposites, right? Let's say you want students to go to school, but if there's a lot of snow, there's not a lot of attendance. It could be strong or weak, which basically means like, you know, is the relationship likely going to happen or not happen? Is strong or weak, okay? And then also, significant or insignificant. Is it important that we have a big, you know, difference or not, you know, what is that? And that's something that um, is subjective or uh, depends on the researcher who's doing that experiment and when you're reading that journal article. 
Correlation ranges from negative 1 to positive 1. 0 means that there is no relationship between the two variables, um, which is represented by the letter R. So when you're reading a journal article, you'll see the letter R, and then you'll see a number between negative 1 and 1. And when you look at that score for the R, wherever it equals to, then you'll see what it means. Is it strong or is it not strong and all the stuff that we just talked about. There's also a p-value. The p-value is the amount of likely error in the correlation. So remember how we talked about the range? There also is a score that is uh, related to that as well. So if the p-value is less than 0 0.05, it's considered statistically significant. Okay, that means that 95% of the time um, it's going to be happening. When the p value is more than 0 0.05, it's considered statistically insignificant, which means that it doesn't really mean that much. Even though it happens, it doesn't really mean that one causes the other. It just happens that it happens that way. Okay, so an example would be an r equals to 0 0.43 right, which we know is more than zero. So that means it's kind of a, a positive, a medium positive correlation. And then if the p-value is less than 0 0.05, that means that it is significant, like it's always going to happen, okay? But we also have to realize that uh, correlation does not mean causation, which basically means that it always has to happen that way. It doesn't because of that. This is the statistics and the study is saying that it happens to happen every time or often, but one does not cause the other, okay? It is, let's say for example, snow, a lot of snow causes, um, or not necessarily causes, but there's a relationship between low attendance, okay? The snow itself does not cause low attendance. It is because parents don't have, let's say, the, the, the proper car, to drive the student to school, let's say, or something like that. Or if the child is taking the bus, it's too cold for that child to go to school, and then the bus is coming less often, so they're like, well, I'm not gonna go to school. So there's actually other reasons why uh, that person's not going to school, but we find that there's a relationship when there's a lot of snow that students don't show up, okay? So does not cause uh, causation, or does not have causation.